Hallelujah. Shall we lift up our hands to heaven and bless the name of the Lord? Give him all the praise. Worship him. Go ahead and bless him. Indeed, there is more. Indeed, there is more. Can you worship him from the depth of your heart? Father, we thank you. Throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high. Exalted in every nation, the sovereign of all creation, Lord. Be magnified. Hallelujah. Father, as a family of faith, we choose to say thank you for the marvelous and awe-inspiring things that you continue to do in our midst. Indeed, no man can do these things except God be with him. And Lord, we thank you for being in our midst. We choose to be grateful. We choose to be discerning. We choose to see the things that you are doing. And Lord, we join the nations from end to end to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the miracles. Thank you for the signs, the wonders. Thank you for the healings. Thank you for transformation. Thank you for salvation. We bless you. And tonight we have come to learn we have come to be built. We have come to be established in righteousness. We pray that our hearts be opened. And we pray that your Holy Spirit and indeed your word will prevail over our minds and our lives. Change us, O God. And let us go from glory to glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Very touched and very humbled hearing the testimonies. You would think that because these realities, uh, you know, every day I receive testimonies from people literally around the world just sharing the marvelous workings of the Spirit through the Word and through this ministry. And you would think that having... Um, gone through this routine for a very long time you would think there would be no more excitement but I tell you sincerely for every time I hear and get to see the wonder working power of God through this ministry across the globe I am humbled afresh you must maintain that attitude of excitement you must maintain that attitude that celebrates the slightest manifestation of the hand of God. For as long as no man can do it by his strength, we owe God thanks and forever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. Please listen to me. I give you a guarantee by the Spirit of the living God. If you pay attention to the things that you are learning, week in, week out. If you make up your mind as a determination to submit yourself to these doctrines and this truth, I give you a guarantee based on the integrity of the word of God, you will never live an ordinary life. Believe me. Believe me. The responsibility is on you to be determined. It is not something you don't get determined when you come to church. You make up your mind. God giving you the grace that I will submit to these truths 
I'm not going to come and argue. I'm not going to come and try to tamper with these spiritual equations. I am childlike enough to receive with meekness, like the Bible says, the engrafted word. The Bible says that the word of Christ should dwell in you in all wisdom. We're not going to become great just by wishing. We're not going to be able to do so much for the kingdom just by blind desire. It takes more than that. There is a pathway according to Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. The Bible says to stand in the way. That ancient path, it says to ask for the old path. Where is the good way? And then it says to walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. So every time I come here for Koinonia, whether it's here in Abuja or any, anywhere at all, I am, I am, I come with a determination and I come with a safe assumption that everyone who would be under the influence of my voice would have made up their minds to receive, not just hear, hearing and receiving are two different things. Make up your mind to not just be a hearer. Oh, I'm writing, I'm writing. Be determined. A student's kind of determination. I am receiving truth that is consistent with scripture, backed up by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. First to help me know the Lord and love him more. Listen carefully. This is the protocol. Number one in order of priority is that my assignment here is to fuel your desire for the things of God. That is my primary assignment in order of priority. That you should never be part of this vision and not love Jesus and not be passionate about the things of God. So your heart and your commitment and your fire, number one. Number two, that you are able to understand the systemic character of God, the structure of the kingdom. That nothing just happens. And then to submit yourself to the truths that make for transformation. Transformation. Metamorphosis. You are moving from one state to the other. Superior versions of yourself. So that the version of you that came is not the version that remains. You should never be the same person who came to church and then you return back as the same person. No, no. Nobody meets with the word of God sincerely and returns back the same. No, you should return wiser. You should return better. You should return with a greater sense of illumination. John 1, 5. And the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So, I want you to make up your mind. If you are yet to do so, make up your mind, inspired by the Spirit and this charge, that every time I come for koinonia or every time I invite people to join me, that includes those who are following from around the world, make up your mind to be a student. Submit yourself to knowledge. Submit yourself to doctrine. Submit yourselves to truth. Be malleable enough to allow the word of God come, not just to inform you, not just to be an addition upon the negative templates that may have been in your mind. You must submit to the word of God. There are things you will hear that are a reminder. There are things you will hear that are a new spiritual information. There are things you will hear that is a tool for deliverance, largely deliverance through transformation. Now, we come from different cultures. We come from different, um, you know, we've gone through different experiences. And when God brings this convergence, listen very carefully, you must submit yourself to learn as though you do not know anything. This arrival mentality is why many people do not receive from the Lord. Are we together? So when you come before the rabbi, the rabbi being the spirit of God, not just the vessel he's using, the spirit of God. You must be intentional. See the value. Listen carefully. See the value behind the truths that you learn. That every spiritual truth, every spiritual principle you learn has value to your destiny. All wise. Not just material value. That is the least. 
the peace and satisfaction that comes to you knowing that you are walking in dominion. Ignorance is dangerous. It keeps you in fear. It keeps you in doubt. The Bible calls knowledge and wisdom stabilizers. It says they shall be the stability of your times. Hallelujah. Every time the word of God is about to come, beware of the following. Number one, distraction. Because Satan wants to fight you from receiving the word. You can be in a meeting and not really be there. Distracted by all kinds of things, whether it's your electronic device or whatever it is. Let your mind, your spirit, your soul, your body be there with a determination to learn. Hallelujah. Yes. Number two, familiarity. You have to be careful. Never get to a point where, oh, you think I know. John chapter 3 verse, then you help the preacher say 16. You will be surprised that it is 16, but you will never learn anything. Hallelujah. Yeah. Approach the word of God with the passion of a child. Jesus was speaking about the kingdom and he said, let the little children come to me. He says, do not forbid them for, for such. That means it will take that, that level, that attitude, being childlike to receive the things of the kingdom. As for me, I remain committed under God to make sure that every opportunity God grants that I do not waste your time shadow boxing. It is my commitment under God to ensure that every time we are gathered like this, you are exposed to sound doctrine that is consistent with the template given by the apostles, consistent with the recommendations of scripture, cut across several divides to the end that we be built and established holistically. The key word, holistically. Lopsided spiritual growth will end us in all kinds of imbalances like we see across the body of Christ. I will never be the kind of preacher who will come to teach you on spirituality and your passion for God and your love for God and ignore the need for you to rise to a position of kingdom influence where your voice be heard and that you are relevant as far as kingdom come is concerned. God, according to scripture, is mindful of every aspect and every dimension of our lives, cutting across mental transformation, fire and passion for spiritual things, the supernatural, finances, peace, all wise. And this we will do as God grants grace. My path is to remain committed. Your path is to remain intentional about reception. So whether you are in the main auditorium or any of the overflows outside or following from across, you know, make up your mind. Every opportunity you have to listen to the truths that come from this altar, be determined to receive them as the words of God to you through a man. Are we in agreement? So one more time, I'd like you to pray tonight and ask the Lord for illumination. The light shineth in darkness. Go ahead and pray. Our destinies are at the mercy of the truths that we know. Is someone praying? Go ahead and pray. You are praying for yourself, but you are also praying for the destinies connected to you. There are destinies depending on your understanding depending on your level of enlightenment, depending on your level of spiritual illumination. For their sake, pray. Pray for understanding. Pray that the anointing that backs the word of God will fall upon you whilst the word of God is taught. Every dimension of spiritual truth has an engracing that follows it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many years ago, I had a vision. You've heard me talk again and again about this vision. In this vision, I was caught up in the realm of the spirit, and I saw this giant door, sort of very ancient door, looked like this ancient city gates. And the Holy Spirit just zoomed that vision closer to me. And I found out that that giant gate or door 
was made up of smaller doors. Smaller doors. Just like if you have an idea of how the post office used to be. You know those boxes? Yes. So that was how it was. And it was opening and closing. Opening and closing. And every time it opened, I saw light coming out of it. Then it would close. Then open again. And as I came closer, I found out that on every one of those smaller doors, there was a scripture written. That was when the Lord taught me that every revelation of truth in scripture has the grace and the anointing that backs it. That means if you claim to have caught a dimension of spiritual truth and you do not have the anointing and the engracing to validate it here and now, it may not yet be a revelation to you. Because for every revelation of God's word that you have that becomes spirit and life to you, there is an anointing that is back of that revelation that compels you to produce results consistent with the truths you have learned. I have taught us here that the assignment of the anointing is to validate the speakings of God. If God does not say anything, the anointing has no ministry. Please understand this. The anointing does not work outside of the word. Here is the balance between the age-long error that has existed, especially among Pentecostals and Charismatics. There are a group of people who choose the anointing and ignore the word, and there are a group of people who choose the word and ignore the anointing. Never has there been such a dichotomy according to Scripture. They work hand in hand. The anointing only begins its operation after the word of God has been sent forth. The anointing is the validator of the word. That means if God says be lifted, the anointing, the engracing that insists that in spite of all odds you remain lifted comes into motion. The anointing is always there, but it has no assignment for as long as the word of God has not come forth. Are we together now? So in order of priority, the word of God precedes the anointing. The Bible never says in the beginning there was anointing. It never says in the beginning there was power. It says in the beginning was the word. John 1.1 1, 1. And the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ called himself the Christ of God. But then his primary name is the word of God. Are we together? Amen. So tonight... I'm here again as a faithful spiritual chef to serve us a menu in the spirit that makes for nourishment, that makes for growth. According to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, and I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart, which will feed you. So every man of God, according to scripture, is a spiritual chef and the assignment of this spiritual chef is to make sure you combine the ingredients accordingly. You don't cook in the presence of the people. You prepare the meal. And when they come, you never call the people until the feast is ready, according to scripture. Is that true? And so when all things are ready, then you go to the byways and the highways and you compel the people to come. This may be an encouragement for a man of God here probably. It is important that we sustain the grace to be diligent. Ministry is serious business. Just because we have advantages like the anointing, the spirit of wisdom, it does not mean that we ignore or negate the need to be students, to study, to be diligent, to be sound in doctrine. Here's how the Bible puts it. It says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if you're in ministry here or God is calling you into ministry, realize that beyond titles, beyond whatever ministerial office, you are mandated by God. Every man of God, every man of God who participates in the ministry of building men must be a teacher. I repeat, every man of God who participates in the ministry of building men must be a teacher. 
the teaching ministry is the exclusive platform that makes for the growth and the maturity of the saints. And if for any reason that man of God is not a teacher, you must unashamedly outsource a sound teaching ministry that becomes the pillar for growth and development. Are we together? Amen. Tonight, I am teaching on a subject that I believe would bless us all, the house of God. Please write it down. We're exploring by the Spirit what the church is, the ecclesia, the house of God. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, Tuesday, or every other day, especially in Africa, we have people moving from their homes to Christian religious places of worship. And on average, most believers will tell you, I am going to church. Is that true? Where are you? They say, I am in church. And the word church has been seldom understood by many believers. And um, we've had preachers here and there try to bring illumination to the subject of the house of God and the church. It is my responsibility under God and my joy to enlighten us according to scripture, to understand in addition to the truths that we have learned and we continue to learn, to understand what exactly is the church. The goal for this teaching is to bring us to superior spiritual knowledge as to the implication of being in and being part of the house of God. Are we blessed? Genesis 28. Let's start from there for a reference. Genesis 28. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's begin our reading from verse 10. This is a scripture about Jacob and his encounter with the God of heaven, the first encounter. He had two principal encounters. The first was in 28, chapter 28. The second was in chapter 22, having been in Laban's house for over 20 years. Now the Bible says, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. Uh -huh. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. The Bible says, and he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows. Now, I don't know how he slept on stones. And lay down in that place to sleep. And the Bible says, he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Follow the dream carefully, 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. At this point, there was no God of Jacob. The land whereon thou liest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed. Uh -huh. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Next verse. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and I will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to you of. This is a good place for someone to say amen. amen. That God is saying, I will not leave you until I do to you everything I said I would do. Amen. 16. Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Right? So we see lack of discernment here. 17. He was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? Here was his conclusion. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. In other words, this kind of experience, based on what my father taught me, if such an experience should happen 
where you have the innumerable company of angels. Is that true? Where you have God himself speaking to edify, to reveal his promises, to show you his ways, and to assure you of his presence. He says this is none other. There is no other environment that can capture this kind of encounter except the house of God. Hallelujah. This is very powerful. Next scripture, Matthew chapter 16. The first biblical mention of the word church. From verse 13, Matthew 16 and verse 13. Jesus was with the disciples and the Bible says he came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi and he asked the disciples. So the revelation of the church according to Jesus began with a question. What is the question? Who do men say that I the son of man am? His identity as the son of man. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias, Elijah now. Some say Jeremiah. Some say you are one of the prophets. And then 15, he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? That means these people are giving their propositions because they are far. They are not close. They have not had the privilege of proximity. Now that you have been with me, we've eaten together, we've gone for crusades together, what is your conclusion about me? And Jesus Christ was amazed that none of them could speak. All of those multitudes, the 72, the 12, now they stood and they were completely in limbo, not knowing what to say in response to that question. 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Now he makes a very strong statement. And I say unto you, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Please keep that scripture there. It says you are Peter, and upon this rock. Now I'm not here to bring up theological debates. Many people have said the rock is Peter. Many people have said the rock. No, 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 no. It's very clear from scripture. He says you are Peter and upon this rock. What rock? Upon this revelation, upon this understanding you have had that I am Christ, the son of the living God. Are we together now? Yes. Upon this revelation, I will build my church. And if allowed to be built by me, it will be so formidable that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Are we still together? So Jesus here is speaking about the church. He made mention of the fact that more than just dying for the sins of the world, that he came to inaugurate an institution. He came to inaugurate a phenomenon, if I would call it, called the church. And he said that this entity will be so formidable. Listen carefully. It will be the entity that sustains the power to triumph and prevail over the gates of hell. The idea of church did not start with the founders of ministries. The idea of church did not start with some of our patriarchs alive and dead. The idea of church was not just a government initiative to have an institution that supports activities um, that relate to faith and spirituality. No. The idea of church was God's own invention. It was a product of God's own intelligence. Listen very carefully. Because many believers view church as several things. For others, 
they believe that church represents a building that has some level of excellence connected to it where believers come together and then they have the opportunity to worship God. Others believe that church refers to individuals. Others believe that church refers to any platform that carries a semblance of spirituality or any platform that seems to have loyalty to the tenets of the Christian faith. So my question tonight very briefly is what is the church? I'm going to be giving you three dimensions of the church in our discussion tonight. What exactly is the church? Because if you do not know what the church is, you will embrace any definition that the devil gives you about the church. The reason why many people do not respect the church is because they do not even understand what it is. It is a very mysterious entity that the government cannot define. It is a mysterious entity that academicians cannot define. It was not a product of a research from an institution. The church came from the mind of the fountain of wisdom himself. So journey with me as we explore three definitions which represent three dimensions to our understanding of the church. Number one, the first revelation of the church according to scripture is found in Jeremiah chapter 51 from verse 20. Please give it to us. Jeremiah chapter 51 from verse 20. It says, thou art my battle axe and my weapons of war for with thee I will break in pieces the nations and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. Uh-huh. It says, and with thee I will break in pieces the horse and his rider. And with thee I will break in pieces the chariot and his rider. And with thee I will break in pieces man and woman. With thee I will break in pieces old and young. With thee I will break in pieces young man and the maid. Last verse. I will also break in pieces with thee the shepherd and his flock. And with thee I will break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen. With thee I will break in pieces captains and ruler. Is there any class of society that was missing here? None. You are my battle axe. I am using you. So the first definition of the church, write it down please, that the church is a spiritual strategy. More than a people, the first revelation of the church that I want you to have is the church as a spiritual strategy, an invention from God's intelligence, a spiritual strategy, listen to me, mandated to be used by God as the only tool that is able to purge, to cleanse, to build, and to reveal Christ and his purposes in its fullness. This is the church. The church is a strategy. For instance, if, um, if I have a flat tire or I have a, pro a problem with my car and I'm unable to move it, I can hire another car that will help to drag it to a place where it will be fixed. And a strategy is usually invented where I can connect, is that true? and connect with a moving car that is alive, a towing van, and then connect to the vehicle, and the towing van pushes it. That, that is a strategy to remedy for something. The fact that the church came into being is already proof that there was something that was not correct. Are we together now? So the church has come as a spiritual strategy to remedy a condition, to remedy a situation. There are names that we are called in scripture. One of it is light, another is salt. Jesus Christ himself called us light and salt. That immediately suggests that for us to be called light means there is darkness. For us to be called salt means there is a level of tastelessness somewhere and lack of preservation. So the church is a spiritual strategy. The church in fact is the only spiritual strategy that sustains the ability to reveal Christ in his fullness 
and to bring him glory. Please write it down. The only spiritual strategy that has the capacity to reveal Christ, to subdue principalities and powers. Oh, this is powerful. Thou art my battle axe. That means wherever there is darkness, wherever there is confusion, listen carefully, wherever there is lack of growth and enlightenment, wherever the purposes of God have not been made institutional within any territory, it is a reflection that the church may not be there or the church may not be shining as light. The church is a strategy. So do not ask why you are put in the midst of darkness. You are a strategy. God's strategy. Are we together? For every car that you buy, usually you would have a few tools in that car. Is that true? Most people would have a toolbox containing screwdrivers and, and, and um, you know, and um, spanners and all of those things. You would have an extra tire somewhere in the car and you would have a jack, you know, to help you if you have a flat tire. All of those things are tools and they are strategies to make sure that for no reason do you stop moving forward if you need to. So when you have a flat tire, what do you do? You go to the back of that car and open up the toolbox and you begin to effectively use the tools that will help maybe replacement. There are times that you can bring out an extra tire that helps to move the car. There are times that you can bring out all kinds of tools. That is how you are. That means whenever there is darkness, God pulls out from his toolbox and brings someone out. The church is a spiritual strategy. Wow. I am not just a man of God. I am a strategy. Do you know what that means? I am a strategy, a tool to be able to achieve something very divine, achieve something very exact as far as the revelation of the Christ is concerned. That immediately cures you from this sense of complex and inferiority. You did not just happen across the surface of the earth. You were a strategy. A strategy takes time to bring forth. Many of you are mathematicians. If you are, you are trying to solve a problem, you sit down, you think, scientists will come up with all kinds of hypotheses and go through all kinds of verification systems until it becomes a theory. You are the final decision of the intelligence of God. Did you hear what I said? Your, your arrival, the church as a strategy, means you are the final decision of a conclusion. The parliament of heaven sat down and thought of how the purposes of God will remain and you were the conclusion of that meeting. The church is a spiritual strategy. The only strategy that sustains the ability to make kingdom come a reality. Is God speaking to anyone? Hmm. So, when you know this, you do not begin to frown at the church every time you see the church involved in issues that represent darkness. If it is true that the church is a strategy, it means that strategy should find expression in politics, in government, in business, am I right? He said, I will break in pieces. And he began to list different people. Men were captured in that experience. Women, maids, rulers, princes, captains, everyone. So, the cure for the political decadence in Africa generally is the church. The cure for the economic problems of men. This is the reason why when you say the church has no business in empowering men, you are already, it is, it is um, what do we call it now? You are insulting the very definition of the church. Wherever there is darkness is exactly where we are invited. Is someone learning now? Yeah. Can I tell you the truth? If everybody becomes a preacher called into the fivefold ministry, the church will die. Because that was not, the Bible says some. He gave some. So the proposition that everybody should become a man of God like to preach 
as the way to bring kingdom come is a very sincere but inaccurate understanding. The pulpit is the platform that shapes the understanding of the people like I'm doing. But the real place of assignment is not the pulpit. The real place of assignment is wherever there is darkness. Help me list a few places that you know in our world today where there is darkness. In one word or two words, everywhere. Am I right on that? Someone say everywhere. Does that include the government? Does that include schools? Does that include our banking system? Everywhere. So how relevant is the church? Are you sure the church should be relevant in activities of finances? Are you sure the church should be relevant in politics and governance? Are you sure the church should be relevant in handling demons and principalities and powers? No other strategy sustains the power to do that. Listen, can I be honest with you? Based on scripture and based on history, almost, and I'm, I'm saying this as an opinion, which is grounded on scripture, almost every other religion and institution that I know do not have the power to cast out demons. What happens is called occultic pacifism. Pacifism is an act of appeasal. It was an ancient ritual that was used to appease demons. That means when a spirit comes and is troubling an individual through some um, activity of necromancy and all of that, you conjure the spirit to ask you what it wants. And the spirit can say, I'm hungry. You are eating and I've not eaten. And you ask, what do you want? He's saying, bring one goat. We, you see it happen in our cultures. Bring one goat, bring one chicken, make sure it's black. And so based on what the spirit is asking for, you politely and laboriously go and look for what it's looking for. And then it will seem to pacify itself. You will see that the individual will have a semblance of healing. Then you continue making progress and the spirit will come again. In ancient times, Old Testament particularly, when they found people who were demonized, they were usually stoned to death. Because since they did not have the ability, except for a few people who were involved in casting out demons. And the art of deliverance or, or casting out demons was not something that was really understood. You see from scripture. So, when Jesus showed up, as a model of the church and there were demonic people instead of killing the people he could neatly with surgical precision separate the influence from the individual and when they saw this they said no you are using Beelzebub the prince of demons you have found a way of rising in the realm of the spirit to negotiate your way with this prince of demons. You are just manipulating us. And Jesus said, no. If I cast it by Beelzebub, by who do your own fathers? Because many of them entered into covenants and fraternity with demon spirits. Now look up, please. Listen. M most of the African cultures today have people who are mediums. Is that true? Their assignment is to be um, the mediators between the spirit entities that control those territories. We have all kinds of names, but they are all the same. So, when a land seems to be barren, listen carefully, when a land seems to not produce optimally, or when there is war and people are dying, or there's a plague or pandemic of some sort, usually, these individuals who can be priests or mediums or whatever they are, they are mandated to go through divination and all kinds of satanic operation to now ask those spirits what is wrong. Is that true? And to do that, they have to use divination and conjure these spirits. Should I teach this now? But listen, listen. The only way you move spirits from one safe location according to them to another safe location is to simulate the habitation of that spirit. Let me give you an instance. Now, we will never glorify the devil in the name of Jesus. But say I were not a believer and say I'm some idol worshiper in the village somewhere. If I want to call a spirit from wherever it is, 
to a festival that is happening. Do you know what I need to do? My first assignment is to study the habitat of that spirit spiritually and then through these sacrifices i simulate the same environment of that spirit it can now live wherever it is and come right there and still feel at home this is the reason why based on that same principle god is comfortable to be in heaven and yet live in your heart because your heart is a simulation of the throne so he can stay comfortable in your heart the holy ghost has never complained living in you are we together now? Yes. What happens is when you go through that process of salvation, something really happens to your heart. It is heaven manifesting in your heart. Now on legal basis, the Holy Spirit can reside within your heart and find the same comfort that he had when he was on Jesus. Powerful mystery. Listen to me. Most of the problems in our world today are spiritual in origin. Did you know that? And then do you believe that? Please believe. Please in the name of Jesus and in the name of wisdom, believe early. That most of the problems that a man will face in his lifetime, personally and institutionally, are largely spiritual in origin. Now, when they manifest physically, they will have political expressions. They will have economic expressions. Are we together? They will have sociological expressions, medical expressions, intellectual expressions, but largely, the same way all things came from the realm of the spirit, all troubles come from the realm of the spirit. For further study, I make reference to the book of Job. And you will learn there that nothing just happens in this realm. The book of Job, we've studied it a bit, at least chapter 1 here. Job was a sincere man who was going about his business. The Bible says he feared the Lord and eschewed evil. And then he would offer sacrifices in advance for his children. Then the Bible says one day something happened in the heavens. Is that true? Satan was in their midst and God made a boast of Job. According to scripture, have you considered my servant Job? And then the devil told the Lord, he said, does he serve you for nothing? Give me the permission to touch him. And you will see, paraphrasing, if he will not curse you to your face. And he said, okay, go. I give you permission to touch every other thing but preserve his life. Sin two, there was a certain day. Everything was finished in the realm of the spirit. Let me digress a bit and challenge you. I made up my mind that nothing will be discussed in the realm of the spirit about me without my participation. <laughs> no way. I will not be a victim of the conclusion of it. No, 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 no. I am a spirit and I dwell in a body. I have the advantage of duality of realms. I have to be invited in that meeting and find out whether the conclusion there has kingdom come connected to it. You don't have to be there in a visionary experience. The word of God is a worthy messenger that can enter the realm of the spirit and represent your interest there. So when I talk of being captured in the realm of the spirit, you don't need a visionary experience. Send the word to be present in that meeting and you are sure that your interest will be defended. Mm. This is how we are represented in the realm of the spirit. We don't have to necessarily be there physically. The word of God uttered from the lips of faith can be captured in that meeting. So when there are principalities and powers sitting down and discussing your destiny, don't keep quiet and be the victim of the conclusion on a certain day. Listen, do you know the attack that was going to happen in the book of Esther? They used divination to find a date. It was the realm of the spirit that gave them a date to attack. They didn't just wish. So the realm of the spirit has a way of measuring the weaknesses of men. And it found that day to be the most conducive for whatever reason. It says strike on this date. It has become a principle today. As military men, most terrorists who go for war, they have priesthood that, that go along with them. They don't just hold the sword. They tie all kinds of things that represent their participation with the realm of the spirit.
So if you are discussing my destiny in the realm of the spirit, even while I'm sleeping, the word of God will show up in that meeting, invited or not, provided you mention my name. Mentioning my name is the invitation. You cannot mention my name and say I'm not invited. Can I tell you, the days that we live in, if you allow things to just happen and you become the victim of the conclusion, you will see things happen in your life that will surprise you. Every time you pray, whether it is convenient or not, you are sending words like messengers to line up in the realm of the spirit. They are like spiritual immigration officers protecting your interest. Anything that does not represent what the word of God said, they have the assignment to fight it even while you are asleep. Some of you, this is why in your sleep, you see all kinds of things happen. The word of God is engaging the realm of the spirit to your advantage. Listen, if you don't believe what I'm sharing now, you are not a Christian. Believe me. Because this is how the word of God works. The word of God does not just work in this physical realm alone. No, he's been exalted above thrones, dominions, and every name that is named. Whether in this world or in the world to come. They were talking about Job. Do you think that Satan just left the presence of God and just ran to Job? He summoned demons. Now here's what will happen. On this day, Thursday, we, this man will wake up in the morning as before. But then it will be tragedy from morning till night. But now in Christ you have the advantage. Why? Because the Spirit of God. If the Holy Spirit can search the mind of God, he can search anybody's mind. Don't worry about trying to know what the devil is doing. The Holy Ghost saves you that trouble. The challenge with many people is that we are not discerning enough to know. So the Holy Ghost comes and then he tells you what to do. And you fire those scriptures. Send them to the realm of the spirit. Scriptures just enter and say, what is going on here? We are discussing his downfall. Based on what? It is written. You shall be the head and not the tail. This is true. Believe it. Listen to me. I want you to believe what I'm teaching you. This is how we reign in this kingdom. So there are many of you now Wanting to know who is meeting against you is a waste of time. You can only respond to the ones that you know. But the word of God, complete and whole, send it in prayer. Send it through your confessions to the realm of the spirit to form a garrison around your destiny. Let me tell you this. Before Jesus died, he kept sending the word that I will die, but after three days I will resurrect. Can I tell you, if Jesus Christ did not send the word, those gates will not open. Because now being dead, he did not have a body. And according to the law of territory, once you exit this realm, it will take someone with a body to call you from that realm. You cannot enter without a body. I know that the gate said, who is this king of glory? But let me ask you a question. Who said, lift up your heads? The same way you can be sleeping and a scripture is saying, touch not my anointed. See, if you don't understand this, you will not understand the ministry of prayer investments that you can send the word of God into 2023. You can send it into 2024. It is only you that celebrates New Year. The word of God does not celebrate New Year. There is no such thing as New Year. The realm of the spirit is, is a continual... Someone in one minute, can you send words? Send words in one minute. 
I am the head and not the tail. In the name of Jesus above only and not beneath. I decree and declare by the power of the Holy Ghost. Gentiles come to my light. Kings to the brightness of my rising. The favor of the Lord is upon my life. I decree and declare. No weapon that is fashioned against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me, it will fall in judgment. Don't be silent. I decree and declare. A thousand shall fall by my side. Ten thousand by my right side. None shall hurt me. With my eyes shall I see and behold the reward of the wicked. That when men say there is a casting down, I decree and declare that there is a lifting up. In the name of Jesus, my path is as a shining light that shines ever brighter, even unto the perfect day. I know whom I believe, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which is committed unto him against that day. I am above only, above thrones, dominions, seated with Christ. In the name of Jesus, blessed in the morning, blessed in the evening, blessed in the afternoon, blessed in the city, favored by the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. Listen. Please hear me, believers. You are being trained to know how to be victorious. This is what you are receiving. A strategy. Hear me. I will tell you the principal way the church is used as a strategy to bring everything to the obedience of Christ. Do you know how? In this kingdom, the church executes its role as a strategy through the power of speakings words the primary tool for change for a believer is not just physical action the words especially when you are dealing with demonic forces when you are dealing with systems and structures there is now a place for intelligence and active participation but when you are dealing with the realm of the spirit it is immaterial even though it is real so the weapons of our warfare but they are mighty through God, the Bible says, to the pulling down of strongholds. It says those weapons, they are able to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ and to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Hear me? For every time you see evil and darkness happening, and you don't do anything about it and say, I am helpless, you are insulting your construction. <laughs> Many times, because we have not seen the power of words in action, we feel that all we do is it just to pray? Go and ask Daniel in Babylon. Ask what the parliament sought for. They said, please silence this man for 30 days. Satan wants to act, but every time the, the, the spirits of the medics and the patients, the word from Daniel will step into the realm of the spirit and, and completely abort that process. They had to come down with an advice that was backed up by government. Silence this man from prayer just for 30 days to give us room to cause havoc. Can I tell you this? It is not lack of money that is making the devil prevail over your family. I told you that when it starts from the realm of the spirit, when it arises physically, it will now have an expression whether it will now diverge itself according to different areas. So when you see that everybody who has a job in your family is losing their job, Everybody who has joy, joy does not seem to last in that family. The fact that you can discern it is proof that God is holding a battle axe that is refusing to rise in his hand. God is saying, I want to do something in this family. And here's what a lot of us say, well, 
I'm, I'm not the wealthiest person. I'm not the most educated. And we bring all those carnal and fleshly excuses. Let me tell you what to do from tonight. Step into your room. Switch from being a man to being a strategy. Lock that door and say, Father, there is something that can be done over this situation. I may not be able to physically give my brother a job. I may not be able to physically stop this plague of death. But in the name of Jesus, step into that control room and begin to send words to manipulate realities from the realm of the spirit until they become consistent with the word of God. Do you believe what I'm sharing with you? Can I tell you this? Every time you pray only in the face of danger, you are praying late. The real advantage of prayer is to go as a forerunner to your results. That means tomorrow's prayer should not be prayed tomorrow. Uh-uh, you prayed late already. Tomorrow's prayer should enter tomorrow and wait for that day. So that anything that is inconsistent with God's word is stopped immediately. Words are powerful. The Bible says, he used words, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Have this mentality. You are not a nuisance to society. Listen, we keep using mundane parameters and not, not mundane because their vanity is necessarily, but that based on the superiority of what you have, we feel that the only time you are relevant is when I have money. Our world loves and celebrates and even worships money. Or sometimes we feel some level of extended intellectual qualification. So we feel I am only relevant if I can buy a car or I can buy physical things. But everyone here who is in Christ, I want you to know that you are a strategy and there is something you can do. If you cannot bring physical money to solve the problem, if you cannot use influence to partner with systems and structures to make change, you can handle the wicked spirits that work tirelessly. Let me tell you this. If God opens your eyes to see the spiritual activities, demonically speaking, that go on from morning till night over the destiny of one person who is not even a preacher, you will be afraid and it will jack you up to be serious. If a legion of spirits entered one man, a legion in one man. Satan has a dogged, a level of doggedness and resilience. If he did not leave Jesus Christ, he left him and returned back. Can I tell you? Every destiny you see, I don't mean to scare you. The beauty and the glory of your destiny seems to be an invitation. Whenever Satan sees light, he goes there to find out exactly what is going on there. Let me tell you one of the ways that Satan knows that you have entered a prophetic season. Because according to the realm of the spirit and according to scripture, Satan is not omniscient. Are we together now? Mm -mm. Satan does not know all things. Satan omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience are three exclusive abilities that make God God. He did not even share that one with man. These are the three principal factors. So when we say he has made us gods, we're right. But I taught you that our dominion is shared dominion, not absolute dominion. Whoever is God is the one who can be omnipresent all places at the same time omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing. Satan is not omniscient. That means he depends on many factors for the supply of his information. One of it is angelic activities. 
Because every time a man steps into a prophetic season, there are heightened angelic activities responding. Do you know what those angels are doing? They are moving across the earth and compelling the human systems that must partner with prophecy to make the word of God come to pass. So the angels are busy making you to go to a Sokoro when you should not go because there is someone you need to meet there. All angelic activities. And the moment Satan discerns a heightened angelic activity around a life, around a ministry, he knows he was once in the system. So he knows. Prophecy is about to happen here. And so he will come and try to fight you one of the ways you know, I've taught you here, that you are stepping into a defining moment is unusual attacks. Let me tell you this. Many, most of them will make no sense. This is why you need to pray. Waiting to understand your situation before you pray is living a defeated life. The prayer language was given as an advantage. An all-purpose weapon. Is someone learning in church today? Say, I am a strategy. Yes, sir. The church is a strategy that was invented by God's intelligence. That means when you downplay the church, you are downplaying the principal strategy that sustains the ability to reveal Jesus. The strategy is not the denominationalism. The strategy it's not the religiosity. The strategy is the church in its purest and its essence. Are we blessed? Please be seated. Thank you. Number two, very quickly. I'm telling you, someone will walk out of this place with confidence. When, when someone comes and says, I just saw you and I felt like sharing something, you will not ask an immature spiritual question, no, 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 I'm not a counselor. You know that, that strategy, because you are a strategy, the Holy Ghost will direct that person. And the person tells you, look, nothing is working in my life. I'm not able to rise. I'm not able to succeed. And while the person is speaking, because you are an effective battle axe, suddenly that anointing will begin to rise. And while you want to look for Apostle Joshua Selman's number, the Holy Spirit will say, no, no, no. He is the one who teaches you that you are the strategy. Now, you do what the strategy does. And you can tell him, well, I'm God's battle axe. Let's pray. And the Holy Spirit said, that's it. That's your own part. You pray. And the person returns by the next day and says, who are you? Then many of us don't have an answer. The devil says, answer him and say, I'm a jobless young Nigerian who just gave his life to Christ and is suffering. Reject that kind of answer. If you don't have anything to say, say, I am a strategy. Strategy of what? The CCTV camera in many organizations is a strategy to ensure and insist that a level of maximum security be kept. Is that true? Yes. So the CCTV is a strategy. And it functions to make sure that it captures the happenings around the vicinity to the end that all who come and go are protected. So God has made us strategies. Regardless where you find yourself, if you find yourself in politics, you are a strategy. That means your assignment starts when you identify what is wrong. Bad governance? Okay. In Africa, I am a strategy. Holy Spirit, there has to be a way. If you find out that economically speaking, people within a territory are not making progress. I am a strategy. And he comes to you as that strategy and says, in explaining you as a strategy, you are a kingdom financier. 
walk with me and let me bless you so that you can establish amenities and give these people an opportunity to enjoy quality living. You are more than a kingdom financier. You are God's strategy to bring redemption. Moses was more than a prophet. Moses was the strategy that God used to bring an exodus of God's people. You know, as I talk like this, I remember the many visions. Let me share one of them with you. It is fresh to me today as it was many years ago. Never fades because it did not come from a human standpoint. I remember in that vision, I was in an elevated place and then I saw a whole generation of people and in that vision they were crying and saying no food and no water i knew it was not just a group of people it was a whole generation and i felt very responsible and then i was talking with those who were in front just like those seated in front i said who is the cause for this and they pointed their hands unanimously at me and said you are the reason while we're starving from lack of food and water. And I said to myself, I said, no, 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 I will not do this kind of evil against you. And then I made up my mind in that vision. I said, I am coming to rescue you. But then I remembered in that vision that it looked like some people had chased me into that place of confinement. And I was just trying to hide like Gideon. And I made up my mind with the courage of Esther. I said, if I perish, I perish. Now watch this. I opened that door. The moment I opened the door to go down, I just saw this giant looking gray bearded, gray headed man. Very old. With a bright garment. Giant man. He smiled at me and he said, give me your hands. He said, I will walk with you. Now I know it was the Holy Spirit. You see, he held my hand and he said, I will walk with you. Very small me, very insignificant me from that vision, but being held by the hands of an ancient giant. Please help those under the anointing. It never tires me to share this experience. Listen carefully. The moment that happened, we were to jump from building to building, but there were small ladders that were connecting one building to building. I was too small to take that giant leap. So he jumped to the other side of the building and was waiting for me to climb slowly through the ladder to connect. And he just placed his hand and was smiling at me. And I was back to myself. What kind of a vision is this? Now I understand. I am a strategy. You must believe that about yourself. You are not just adding to the census, the number. If you, don't, if you don't have this mindset, you will live a defeated life. You will live an angry, jealous, defeated life of failure. You must know that you count. This is more than a motivation. God is counting on you. Don't say there are many people. There is a unique assignment to you as a strategy. Watch this now. Imagine with me for a moment that those who hold the keys to the doors here one person have you been stranded in a meeting because one person did not do his duty have you seen people like that yeah imagine the crowds of people here inside and outside unable to access this facility simply because the man who was holding the padlock to the main gate fell asleep and he just gets up and says sorry um i've kept you people here for four hours i really was asleep that's how significant you can be. That means if you do not arise with the mindset of a strategy, if you're a man of God here, hear me. Don't say there are too many churches. No, there are those uniquely assigned to your grace. And if you fail because you think people are doing great things, if you fail, provided you are genuinely called. Most times men of God come to me, sincerely so, and they say, Apostle, well, you are the people who are doing ministry. We are here, you know, just a joke, but then an honest joke to express that we are not making progress. And I tell them something. I said, listen, if the whole world depended on Joshua Selman to supply the spiritual nourishment, the church will fail. 
fail so woefully because there are many dimensions captured in this assignment that have not been given to me. And you must be unashamed to admit, accept, and then celebrate the other investments that cut across the body. Wait for my teaching, the unity of faith. Hallelujah. Yes. Encounter with the body of Christ. So when you know this, you can encourage someone. He is playing this keyboard right now. The sound people are doing what they are doing. Everybody working to make this happen. I know that you give the credit to Joshua Selman because he's the face that you see. But behind this face, this strategy, there are other strategies that are making it happen. One more time, prophesy to yourself. Say, I am God's strategy. I think that's a better expression. Because if you say you are a strategy, um, your efficiency depends on who built you. We have fake products and we have real products. Fake products are products, but they are limited by the inexperience of those who produce them. Is that true? There is what we call original. And usually when people build an original product, they have some sort of seal of authenticity that they put on that product. I am God's strategy. If you are a politician, know this. I am God's strategy in politics. A businessman, I am God's strategy in business. You are a minister, I am God's strategy. Can I be honest with you? Every time I come for koinonia or travel for ministrations, many times um, it, it, it can be quite exhausting sometimes. But then I'm awakened by the fact that I am God's strategy privileged strategy for this meeting when I come into a meeting and I sit down and I look at the people I begin to get happy do you know why because all they need to do is to invite me upstage leave me and the devil leave me and principalities leave me and yokes and causes leave me and ignorance leave me an imbalance I know what to do to them listen fire does not fear how many things are put on it. Mm -mm. You don't put wood and fire says it's too much. You just leave it for a while. Fire never says too much. Uh -uh. It sustains a unique ability. You can't catch it, yet everything physical submits to it. He makes his angels winds and his ministers flames. So when someone comes to me and says, Apostle, there is darkness around my life, there is spiritual ignorance, I'm losing my fire for the things of God, another word, a summary to what you have said is, I need you as God's strategy to be used by God to step in. And with all pleasure, you are welcome. May God locate you in an area where your efficiency will be without struggle. By, by this charge, let me wrap up this first part by encouraging you. Listen to me. The moment you find yourself struggling in an area is proof that the grace is not there. Don't kill yourself and say, there are people who are not ministers of the gospel like preachers. Just admit it with all honesty and look for where there is grace for you. There are people who are not called into the prophetic they have stretched themselves almost to death because they want to make sure they operate in the prophetic. There are people who are not apostles. It is not a, it is not a degradation. There are people who are, who are beautiful pastors. They are shepherds. They may not even be very effective teachers, but they are homely. They can bring everything together. When you find yourself operating in an area, how many of you have held a bunch of keys and they are all keys, but you use the wrong key for a door? Sometimes it can even enter the hole and not be able to turn. It looks exactly like the real key, except that it is not. I submit to you, therefore, that you must obtain grace from God to really know what area have I been assigned to? Some of you are intercessors, 
like Anna the prophetess, like Simeon the prophet, find rest in that noble ministry and see it as noble as preaching before a crowd on a crusade ground. There are some of you who are kingdom financiers. You may never have the opportunity to minister as we are doing, but God has anointed you to be the strategy that ensures that the work of the kingdom never fails. Don't fail in that assignment. There are many kingdom financiers who left the work of kingdom financing to go to the pulpit simply because there seems to be some psychological attachment to being on the pulpit, especially when you are leading and heading the ministry. Psychologically speaking, you are generally considered. If I ask you to arrange people in the kingdom according to nobility of call, chances are that you will place people like us in front simply because of the supposed charismatism around our call. But you may be wrong. It will take God to arrange people according. Do you know, the more God hides you, the more you are nobler. Look at it in the building of the human body. There are parts that you cannot see. Imagine if your heart was on your head. You would die when an angry person comes near you. He will hold that heart and squeeze it till you die. So God kept it and covered it with bones. Now you ignore the heart simply because it's not the hands and the fingers you are seeing. When your heart fails, let every other thing be alive. You will still die. Correct? So, I'm teaching you as kingdom people that the more you are exposed, doesn't mean you are not noble. Every call is a high calling. But let me tell you, when God intentionally hides you and makes you to play a background role, just know that he's protecting you jealously. It is a sign that you are truly noble. Some of the people who pray for me as a ministry, you may never see them. They may never come on this pulpit. I met with a group of women um, a few weeks ago while I traveled to a particular region and I was told that these women, very, about seven or so of them, very, very, you know, um, marvelously helped by God, accomplished women. And they said, Apostle, God gave us a mandate to pray for you. We are your intercessors by God. When I saw them, I was so broken. I said, How, what do I do to these people to let them know that I love and appreciate them? Now, when you see Joshua Selman doing well and doing exploits, you think he's just a product of his personal prayer life. Until the day we stand before Jesus, you will see how many people's prayer provided the leverage for us to rise to this level. And anybody, listen, let me teach you. The moment you are in a position of visibility, be wise enough to know that the invisible is what bets the visible. Are we together? Because our world is sensual and carnally minded. Chances are that you who is the one in the elevated position that is seen by everyone, usually if someone wants to sow a seed now, Chances are that he will not give you the seed as my intercessor. It's me you will bring the seed to because he believes I am the one blessing him. But let me tell you, when God's reward system begins to spread around, he will pick you and honor you with the same gravity that he's honoring the preacher. There are people because of their efficiency as God's strategy, Praying for men of God, for instance, praying for nations, you will find out that God will covenant with them that their whole family must have leaders. They may not be very educated, but you will never lack leaders in those families. It is God's covenant and his reward system. I hope that one time we'll have the opportunity to, to look at the subject of prophetic intercession. And I'm going to be teaching you the benefits and the blessings that follow an intercessor. But for now, it's sufficient for you to know that you are God's battle axe. Next time someone looks at you and says you are useless, a non-entity, either because some physical results that they expect to be there is not there, maybe like money, a car, a house, or some, some earthly parameters of defining success, find solace in the fact that you are a strategy. Every key remains dormant until it gets to the door it was assigned to open. You can hold a key for a long time and think that key is useless. If that is the key that opens the restroom, 
when you are pressed, you will know how efficient that key is. If that is the key to the kitchen, when you are hungry, you will know how efficient that key is. So that God may not seem to be doing so much physically with you, it does not mean you are not part of that army. It does not mean, it's just that we have not gotten to the page of the story where your relevance is needed. Keep building yourself. Keep waiting, knowing that you are a strategy. Mary, you are a strategy. But if the angel has not announced the coming of Jesus, it will look like you are just an ordinary woman. Be patient. Elizabeth, if, if John the Baptist is not yet uh, ready to come, it will look like you are just some barren woman who married a prophet. I am God's strategy. Number two, what is the church? Is God speaking to someone? The church refers to the men and the women. So first the church is a strategy and then the second the church refers to the men and women, the human vessels. The human vessels. That are number one, the host of heaven on earth. And then number two, the executors of God's purposes. I will take it again. The church refers to men and women that are number one, the host, H-O-S-T-S. -S. We are the ones who host God. God will not go and dwell in some mountain somewhere. He dwells in believers. So the church refers to these human vessels that have sustained the ability to hold this treasure, heaven in us. And then the church also refers to the men and the women who are the executors of God's purposes. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. Let's hurry up. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, Ye also as lively stones are built into are built up into a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ he calls us lively stones he says we are a spiritual house though human we are that temple that God resides he resides in me he lives in me the reason why you feel the presence of God on earth, the reason why you see him manifest on earth is because there are human vessels that have accepted to be hosts for him. And number two, there are human vessels that have accepted to be the executors of his purposes. Can I tell you this? Plans and purposes are vain until you find not only a strategy, you find the human vessels that are willing to execute it. I give you an instance. If you come up with a beautiful plan, even a beautiful strategy, say for building a structure like this, you will need someone who will carry that plan and translate it from what is written on paper to this material expression. The church in addition to being a strategy, we are the executors of the will and the purposes of God. That means every time God wants to execute his will and his purposes, we are the ones he sends. Are we together? Romans chapter 12, please. Give us Romans chapter 12 and we'll start our reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. It says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, uh -huh. so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of another. The church does not just refer to a strategy alone. The church also refer to a people a people the people God's chosen people the ones who become the principal executors of his will and his plan let me tell you what that means that everything God decides to do is executed on earth through the church 
Here's how Jesus put it in his prayer. He says, when you pray, ask the Father that it be done in earth as it is in heaven. The earth there is not just talking about the physical land. The first earth is you. Let it be done in my life and then through my life as it is in heaven. That means when there are no human vessels, look up please. Did you know that every time there are no human vessels, even when there is a strategy for God's program, God's program becomes limited until he finds a man. Read your Bible and see how many times God's programs were delayed because there were no sufficient human vessels that were worked upon and trained to be the executors of his will. It took Moses a long time. God had a strategy to save his people from Egypt and to take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. But he needed a man and then from that man, he would mobilize a people. Same thing happened to Gideon when they had come under the yoke of the Midianites. God found a man, Gideon, and from that man, he mobilized 32,000 people and they were reduced to 300. And Gideon, alongside 300 men, brought victory for the nation of Israel. Can I tell you this? The church refer to men, not cheers. Cheers without men is not the church. A good sermon without the men to listen to it does not make the church. The church refer to the men and the women. Based on this definition, you see that this whole idea... Now, I say this respectfully, but this whole idea of refusing people from coming to the house of God to hear the word of God uh, simply because uh, sometimes it's misunderstood to be just a passion to have crowd. No, no. The church refers to men and women. And if those men and women are not there to hear, to be changed, it means that the purposes of God will suffer because there would not be sufficient people to be executors of the same. Are we together? In gathering is your, your, your kingdom responsibility to bring in more men to the fold so that they be trained, so that they be equipped and then they can be used by God. Without men, there is no church. Assume with me, for instance, that I come in here and there is absolutely nobody. Now I'm preaching and I'm talking. All I'm doing is just rehearsals or talking with the Holy Spirit. But as far as church is concerned, church happens when there is God and when there are men. It took God and Jacob to be called the house of God even heaven is not called the house of God it took God and a man on earth and Jacob said surely this is the house of God even though the gate of heaven can I tell you this if you are a preacher here or you are a worker in church you have a kingdom responsibility to see that in gathering never ceases with you. You have a kingdom responsibility, not through force and manipulation, but through revelation, that it is noble every time you bring people to the house of God, you give them an opportunity to experience the ministry of transformation, of building, of training. The more God finds men, the more his purposes can advance. Did you believe that? Yes, sir. The more genuine believers we have within our territory, the more the purposes of God can find expression. When there are few men who call upon the name of the Lord, when there are few men who sustain spiritual intelligence, it's going to be difficult to advance the purposes of God. So we have to continue to pray that in as much as God has blessed us as a ministry and as a global family, there are still many people who need to be part of this fold. And we must continue to trust God that through the signs and wonders, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and through the responsibility of ingathering, God is going to grant grace that his house be filled with men 
Not just men who endorse the call of a man of God, but men who can be trained, can be equipped, and can be efficient. Man of God, if that is your motivation for ingathering, fire on. But if the motivation becomes a mundane pursuit just to bring some accreditation and add to the list of those who are making things happen, it is not a pure motivation. My motivation as a man of God has always and will ever remain to see that God brings as many people who need to be trained, who need to be equipped and to be released to become um, this vast army that God will use for kingdom come. And this we will not fail to do in the name of Jesus Christ. So every time you say the church, you are referring to a spiritual strategy. The strategy that brings dominion over principalities and powers and sees to it that Jesus Christ is enthroned. When you say the church, it also refers to men. Without men, there is no church. I repeat, without men, there is no church. That means... The extended meaning of this is that every time God sends men to church, we must obtain the grace to treat those men with honor, knowing that without men, there is no church. Now, it is not a license to come and trouble people in church and people just transfer the pain they've had from office and the pain they've had from other things and just punish the church to be... The, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm teaching. But I'm saying that if you know that the church refers to men. Every time God sends those men, you are grateful and you serve them the meal of God's word principally and then make sure that within the time that they are under your influence, they feel the love, the warmth, the peace, the fellowship that befits those who are called by the name of the Lord. Herein lies my reservation about Ignoring the relevance of men as far as making a church happen. Now, you know, people are subject to their whatever it is that they have uh, to say as far as kingdom come is concerned. But I will never be the man of God who will come here and downplay your relevance and downplay the fact that you are here. The reason why I am effective doing what I am doing is because you are here. Can I tell you the truth? No matter how sound your call is, if God does not send the men to come and listen and be trained and submit to that teaching, you are not effective. For God so loved the world. When Jesus came, his entire attention was on men. Even when he resurrected, he went back to men to train those men to keep helping men. The church refers to men. Invest in excellence. Invest in in media, invest in quality sound, but not to the detriment of the men. That means if the church refers to men, the highest attention should not be given to speakers. The highest attention should not be given to aesthetics. The highest attention should not be given to some other non-human entity. The highest attention in any church should be to the men. And that means that the most important part of any church service, if I would use that expression, is the part that deals directly with men. The worship, the prayer, the word. Did you know that everything from opening prayers to the grace is about men? When you are praying, you are praying that God will make the service a blessing. The worship, the worship team is calling us together in worship to just press into God as we lay down our crowns and worship him. The testimonies are coming to encourage men and to become a blessing that people can believe. The word session, it comes as a system of building and edification for the men. Everything is about men. Man of God, when ministry becomes all about you, there is something wrong. When ministry becomes all about Joshua Selman, the alpha and the omega of the activities that happen there, you may be well-meaning, but something is wrong. True ministry is not about the man that God uses. 
There is a place for the honor that priesthood demands. But I'm telling you, the real assignment of a minister is to build men. If you hate those men, you can never truly build the people you hate. You can never... Let me give you an advice. Again, if you're a man of God or you are involved around ministry, never be exalted too high that you lose touch with the men you are sent to because you will be aborting and even destroying your assignment. The reason why you are called is for the men. Without men, there is no church. We must sustain compassion. We must sustain the, the stamina to deal with men and to do so well. As many of you know, I've had quite a, a, a very serious schedule right from Wednesday. I've been traveling over four states or so, and then this morning, and then right here. And sometimes people say, Apostle, you're stretching yourself too much and all of that. But when I remember that the church is not a building, when I remember that the church is not this pulpit, the church refers to men. The men that Jesus died for. The men that he so loved and loves. The men that he will use to birth his purposes. The men that become the principal conduit for kingdom come. I am motivated afresh to bend over backwards to see that those men are trained. I believe in excitement. I believe in joy. I believe in fun. I believe in gladness of heart but can I tell you we must trust God to restore the discipline of discipleship to make sure that every time we gather we do not waste the time of God's people are we together by the grace of God God will grant us grace that every time you come here everything that makes up the program is intended to be a blessing to you men it is all about men in as much as it is all about Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world. That was his motivation. The church is a spiritual strategy. The church refers to men and women. The vessels that he will use to birth his purposes. Number three, and this is the last point for tonight. The church also refers to an institution. The only institution that is mandated to teach and mentor and build people in the ways of God. The church is an institution. Write it down, please. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. The church also refers to an institution. Not a spiritual institution. A physical institution. 1 Timothy chapter 3. The B part says, To behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. The Bible calls it the pillar and the ground of truth. That means whenever you are looking for, there is a place in Abuja they call fish market. That means when you are looking for fish, where do you go to? You don't run to a bank. You don't run to a bank and meet the cashier and say, can I have tilapia or can I have a shark or can I have all of this? They will take you straight from there to the hospital. Is that true? Yeah. That means every time you are searching for a place where you can find truth, truth being Jesus, truth being doctrine, truth being the ethics that make for civil living and intentional living and visionary living. The church is that institution mandated with the responsibility of shaping culture correctly. The Bible calls it the pillar and the ground of truth. Are we learning now? It is based on this definition that our regular convergence as believers for church services, for midweek services become valid, provided that the things that are communicated within that institution are truths. That number one, reveal Jesus. Number two, equip the believers. Number three, help in contributing to the moral, the spiritual, the economic stability of a region, the church. 
The church is not just a place for Christians. The church is a ground and the pillar of truth. Two more scriptures. Are you blessed? Hebrews chapter 10, please. We'll read verse 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10. The Bible says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. 20, 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. The Bible says, as an institution, do not neglect the assembling of ourselves together. Say after me, the church is an institution. Now, I know that sociologically we call it a religious institution. Well, from a secular standpoint, we agree. But from a kingdom standpoint, the church is not a religious institution. The church is a real institution. Are we together? Valuable to God, valuable for nation building, valuable. The church is the principal contributor for uh, as far as the, the um, moral correctness of a territory is any territory without the church will be a territory of lawlessness and mayhem and carelessness and indiscipline and lack of responsibility. When you know this as a man of God and when you know this even as a state, you will respect ministers, not just as some religious by gods who are around indoctrinating people with uh, some kind of spiritual ideas. No, we are contributors to nation building because we are bringing principles that are applicable here and now even though spiritual in context but they have their applicability everywhere the church is an institution are we together next time you are you are listing the institutions that you have we have educational institutions that are mandated with the responsibility of making sure that secular ed education happens within a territory that people are academically enlightened we have all kinds of institutions we have the judiciary as an institution mandated with the responsibility of making sure that justice and fairness and equity is protected we have a political system as an institution mandated with the responsibility of leadership and governance. The church is an institution. Whenever you are confused about life, whenever you are confused about purpose, whenever you are confused about destiny, whenever you need to find God, whenever the devil is oppressing you and buffeting your life left, right, and center, whenever you are, find, you are looking for a place where you find a family of like-minded people, the solution is the church. Can I tell you this? When you want to make good friends, come to the church. Ah, apostle, church? Yes, sir, church. Forget about your experience. The church. The church. There is no guarantee from Scripture that God said, I will tabernacle in a bank. There is no guarantee from scripture that God said, I will tabernacle in a classroom. There is no guarantee from scripture that God said, where you gather in the law court, I am there. Mm -mm. But God made a covenant with his house that his presence would jealously be represented in his house. So as an institution, the church is the principal avenue for learning the ways of God. The manual for the growth and the maturity of the believers in the church is the Bible in partnership with the Holy Spirit. If the Bible is administered outside of the leadership of the Holy Spirit, it just becomes a historic material. The Bible only comes alive when the ministry of the Holy Spirit is honored. And then we are taught the ways of God. We are mentored and we are guided. Listen to me. Please hear me, believers. During the pandemic last year, sadly, when there was a lockdown for about three months or thereabout, do you know how many people's lives went down spiritually and otherwise? 
because there are people based on their background they have no family anywhere there are people who have lost father listen to me people who have lost mother the only family they have literally is the church do we agree on that there are people who support financial support comes from the church there are people today educated because they were part of the church. There are people who have found purpose and meaning to their lives because they were part of the church. You cannot tell how many people today who have found relevance in their lives only because they came to the church. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house. That is why the church is called the house of God. If you are looking for love, you will find it in the church. If you are looking for family, you will find it in the church. Apostle, but my biggest pain has come from the church. That is because the devil also came to the church. So we have to get him out of the church. He's not invited. There are people today when they lose loved ones, they have nobody to come and mourn with them but the church. There are people today, when it's time for celebration, marriage, children, whatever it is, it is the church that comes to rally around them. There are people when they are in pains today, nobody can stand but the church. Never you ignore the church as an institution. The church is that one family. There are two kinds of families on earth. There is the physical family that is of biological origin, but there is the spiritual family. The spiritual family is a real family. If you are in church, you must have this family mentality. Coming to church is like coming home. The only place where God can accept you as you are while he's changing you. Can I tell you this? If you ignore the church, there are many things you will not be able to achieve. There are times that your fire can go down and then you come to the church and you sit down. You know, sitting and hearing the testimonies of these precious people and I'm wondering, what if there was no church? There was no church for three months and some people did not just backslide. They just went completely. It's like they... Do you know that Moses' absence for 90 days... You know what he came back and met? These were people who were calling upon Yahweh. Moses went up the mountain, not that he went to sleep. He went to meet God. He came back and found an idol that was made with the precious gold that God gave them. And they said, this be the God that brought us out of Egypt. Moses was angry. He made them grind that thing to powder and drink it. And God punished him because of it. You, you, you see how this thing works? He had to go and carve that rock by himself. Can I tell you this? I know that many of you have been wounded from church. I know many of you have had bitter experiences from church. But regardless what has happened, church still remains your zone of safety. Can I tell you this? I repeat, the church is the safest place. Everybody cannot be a devil. All you need is to find one person who loves you genuinely. One person who loves Jesus genuinely. One person who prays genuinely. And I can tell you there are enough people in every true church to communicate the love of Christ. <clears throat> Hallelujah. It is God's idea and it is his intention that every believer becomes part of a larger community of believers for the purpose of, you see, community living is the key to sustaining kingdom values. It's going to be difficult for you to excel in isolation. So when God picks you, he connects you to a larger body of believers. It is your assignment to connect indeed. This is the place of encounter. Do to me what you want. This is the place of surrender. This 
This is the place where my life is changed. Let me tell you this. By the privilege of leadership, especially for many years and even now, largely among young people, I have learned the power of the church as an institution. I have met people who have lost father, lost mother, and literally have had to depend on the church for everything that their physical family would give them. I have had the privilege, and I say this to the glory of the name of Jesus, of helping to raise people literally, some from primary school, secondary school, even university, the church. There are people today who would never go to school if they were not in church. There are people today who would never get a job if they were not in church. There are people today who would never find love if they were not in church. There are people today who would never even be able to bury their loved ones if they were not in church. There are people today who would never have been able to marry if they were not in church. There are people who would never be able to take care of their children if they were not in church. The church is not a disadvantage. Please find a way of, of believing this tonight. The church as an institution. There are people who hate anything church. And they bring all kinds of stories and all kinds of memories. They tell you the church is a place where there are corrupt people. There are politicians. There are devils there. Do you stop using the road because there was an accident there? That is the only road available. The church is a blessing. Jesus is the head of of the church. If you don't trust the body, trust the head. Did you hear what I said? Let me repeat myself. If you don't trust the body, trust the head. The body may fail, but the head may never fail. He will never fail. The church is an institution. So as you gather week in, week out, here in Koinonia and all of the churches that are scattered represented in the body of Christ, I want you to have this mindset. Whenever you pick your Bible, you pick your children, and you are on your way to church, remember this, that number one, the church is a spiritual strategy. Number two, I am that church. In addition to God's strategy, I am the host and then the executor of his will and his plans and his purposes. His purposes depend on me. He can do without me, but he has chosen to involve me in his program. So you don't go to church as a second class citizen. I'm not the one leading worship. I'm not the head of department. I am just a regular worker. Did you know sometimes people send me text messages and they say, Apostle, uh, good afternoon, sir. I am a regular or I'm just an ordinary Koinonia member. And sometimes even when I don't want to reply, I'm tempted to reply, there are no ordinary members here. Everyone is the church. The nature of our work may seem to provide some level of elevated positions, but I tell you intrinsically, every single one, as far as Christ is concerned, we carry equal value, the value and the price being the blood of Jesus. Are we blessed? And I advocate this and I, I cry and call on men and women of God as much as possible Give honor to whom honor is due, but we must be careful so that we do not allow the broken and those who feel that they are no good come to church again and further feel miserable simply because you are not wearing a designer's, simply because you don't seem to speak very fluently. I made it as a personal commitment as a man of God that when it has to do with honor, I will communicate honor to all men and to those deserving of honor. But when it has to do with my disposition towards men, I will treat everybody with love and I will treat everybody with sincerity. If I'm giving a hug, I'm not going to hug you because you are rich or because you are holding an envelope and then hug another person and look at him and almost be asking, what are you doing here? No, no. 
it has never been my philosophy to treat people as far as my attention is concerned based on whatever it is. No, whoever your father is, whoever your mother is, whoever you are, thank God for your pedigree. You would be given honor that is commensurate to your sacrifice. But as far as my mindset and my understanding is concerned, everybody who God brings to this place is a valuable and a special person. In truth, I may not be able to reach everybody. I wish I could. I really will. Sadly, I'm not able to do so. But I'm using this message tonight to talk to you and to talk to our global family that as far as Joshua Selman is concerned and Koinonia is concerned, there are no ordinary members. Everybody who was purchased with the blood of Jesus is a special and a unique person. Whether you sit inside, whether you sit outside. I remember during the graduation of the School of Ministry students, um, I was walking around. Usually that's what I do because I'm not preaching. So I was walking around and I was almost going to look for a place to sit. And all these, my security and protocol people, they would not let me rest. They were doing their job, you know. And I was standing and people were watching me as though it was Jesus Christ. And I said, come on, listen, listen. I'm a human being. My mother is alive. My father is alive. It is only the privilege of God's grace. I only sit here because of leadership, because of protocol, and because of the assignment. The day I'm not doing that assignment, I should be able to sit anywhere and feel comfortable. If I cannot do that, I'm only insecure. It has nothing to do with God. Because my value is not based on the position. My value is the revelation of who I am. Learn this. Are we together now? So if you find me seated somewhere up there and I sit in between two people and I'm listening to the word of God and say, wow, powerful, this is great. Chances are that you can even be uncomfortable there. <laughs> Believers, listen to me. I have an assignment to see that you are grounded in truth and that every time you say church, so for people who neglect the gathering of the believers and they say church is just in the heart. Correct them and say you are right but not completely right. There is something you only receive when believers are gathered together. Are we together now? That corporate gathering, Psalm 133, behold how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. The Bible says it is like the oil that comes upon the head of Aaron down to his beard, to his skirt, to his garment, and so on and so forth. It says there God had commanded the blessing. Hallelujah. Now there are two things we are going to do before we pray. Please rise everybody. I'm going to give you a little task in one minute. You're going to walk around to as many people as you can find in one minute. And even if it is to appreciate them and greet them and tell them we are the church. You are valuable. You are blessed. Bless them with all your heart. Don't waylay anybody. Go ahead. Make sure you're doing it inside and outside. Honor them and appreciate them sincerely. You don't have to know them. Together we are the body of Christ. Regardless what you believe, regardless what you don't believe, regardless what family you come from. It's a culture. Now please return back to your seat rejoicing. Hold hands together if you can. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, 
Let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. The walls of pride and prejudice shall cease. When we are your instrument, Listen to me, let me encourage you. Never make it a culture. Never look down on anyone. In terms of stratification, in terms of finances, in terms of spiritual exposure, in terms of enlightenment, the truth is we are not at the same level. Nevertheless, you should be comfortable to hug somebody whose father is some relegated thing somewhere. This is the church. They should be able to find that kind of love without explanation, love without reason. The moment you have a reason, it is no longer love. So someone comes to sit near you and you frown your face because you are all wrapped up in your designer. They say, turn to your neighbor and you just look at, don't you turn. No, no, no. You may be saying no to the next 10 years of your life. Can I tell you this? There have been times before, you know, God made me a known face. There were times when people began to hear about me and what God was doing. But because the people had never seen me, they did not know this was the apostle. And, you know, it was not the best of experience. And then when they did find out, that I was that man of God. They suddenly came back with some uh, hypocritical approach and I said, no, no, no. The first you is the real you. That you that did not behave well is the real you. So make it a point of duty. The first core value in this ministry is love, not power, love. Everything is motivated by love. Are we together now? Yes. That when they share the grace, you don't just stand up and carry your children and you push everybody and go out. No. Hello, good morning. Good afternoon. You are going to walk after the service. Oh, God bless you. This is very important. You may think this is just some childish Christian thing, but you may be healing. Someone right now may be listening to me. And finally, people are looking for a home more than a sermon. People are looking for a home. You can listen to a sermon online. You cannot find a home online. There is a difference between listening to teachings online and being in the presence of God here. A place of genuine laughter and love. No pretense. Are we together? It is His will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. Some of you, if you had, if you had your way, you would reject that part of the song. I don't need it to serve. You do, you do. Come to terms with it. Listen, God is not ashamed to declare how vulnerable he is towards us. I need you to be an effective preacher. No matter how anointed I am, your coming here, among the many things that it does, is it validates the fact that we are a blessing. There is nothing to tell lies about. There is nothing to be ashamed about. You see, when people know you are sincere, they will love you truly. But when you are playing games and doing all of these things, the people would let you know they are not stupid. When people come here and there is room for interpretation, maybe the miracle service, the moment I discern they are struggling to speak English, I tell them, say any language. Be comfortable. I'm not going to respect and honor you just because you are speaking Polish Queen's English. That is an advantage, but not the basis for the love. Provided you name the name of Christ, you deserve to be loved. I pray tonight that this teaching will help to build our understanding and make us very, very matured believers. We're going to pray. Our time is gone. Prayer point number one. Lord, help me to be effective as your battle axe 
as the man that you will use in this season. Please, we are praying. And then number three, as part of this institution called the church, lift your voice and pray. Let it be from the depth of your heart. I am your battle axe. Use me for your glory. In whatever way you see and however you please. Go ahead and pray. I will go. I will go. Everywhere you lead me. I will go. I will go. I will go. Wherever you lead me. I will go. I will go. I will go. I am your battle axe to whatever nation, to whatever region, whatever the responsibility is. My soul says yes, says yes, says yes. My soul says yes. Someone is praying, Lord, I am that available battle axe. Sharpen me and make me ready to be used especially in this time. Lord, if you're healing someone in this nation, don't do it without me. Don't do it without me. Lord, if you're lifting someone in this city, please don't do it without me. We are praying, don't be tired. Whoever you want to lift, Lord, you can lift through me. Whoever you want to bless, Lord, you can bless through me. Whatever you want. To say, Lord, you can say through me whatever you want to do, Lord, you can do. Listen, whoever you want to heal, Lord, you can heal. Whoever you want to change, Lord, you can change. Very powerful song. I'm available. Use me for the change. Use me for the healing. Let me not be the one causing the pain, but bringing the healing. Whoever you want to bless, whoever you want to save, whoever you want to transform, oh God, I'm here as your church. Find comfort in using me. Hallelujah. The last prayer point and we're done. Please hear me. We must pray first for koinonia and then for every church as a local assembly and every platform that provides the gathering of believers. Can I tell you, we cannot lose the church as an institution. Westernization should not be the reason why we lose the gathering of the saints. There is a blessing. The church is a platform for mentorship that builds, that trains, that equips. 
it is the place where people can find God. The church is a city of refuge. The church is akin to the ark of Noah. When rain was about to fall, they found a place of safety. Are we together? This is your house, your home. We welcome you, Lord, we welcome this is your house, your home. We welcome you today. Last prayer point. The grace to be an active part of this institution called the church. Lift your voice and pray. Active through in-gathering. Active as a worker. Active as, an, as a participant not a fan there are no fans in the church there are active people praying, serving bringing souls providing financial resources Lord whatever role I have to play to keep this institution that is the pillar and the ground of truth alive I obtain grace go ahead to pray Pray for every local assembly you know. Lord, keep them. Keep that institution. Keep the building from being idolized. But let it become a center for transformation. A center for salvation. A center for encounters. The house of God. It is only in the house that God has commanded the blessing. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. Receive it as a blessing. That's what you get when you come to church. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family. Amen. Father, we pray that Koinonia will remain a place of encounters. We pray that Koinonia will remain a place of revelation. We pray that Koinonia will remain a place of transformation. We pray that Koinonia will remain the house of God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we declare from tonight's teaching that we are willing to be sharpened battle axes that you will use to beat down the gates of darkness. Lord, we declare that we are the men and women you have found worthy to become hosts of your presence and advancers of your purposes. And Lord, we thank you for this family koinonia we thank you for every church and every ministry represented in the body of christ oh god strengthen the bond of fellowship bring unity over your body let all the walls of the divides the prejudices and all the things that divide us and weaken our strength 
I pray, oh God, that they will fade in light of what you are doing. But as for this ministry, I pray that you will increase our bond of love. You will increase our bond of fellowship. That in truth, we will love one another without discrimination. We will love one another without favoritism. We will love one another in spite of our different levels of stratification. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we commit ourselves to love one another. We commit ourselves to loving you. And we pray that in and through our lives, Jesus will be revealed. We pray by extension, oh God, committing our global family scattered across all the nations of the earth. In the name of Jesus, we pray that that bond of unity and that bond of love will rest upon every one of us. We pray for the teachings, the principal channel that you have used to extend your blessing through us to the nations. Lord, anoint those teachings afresh. May they go across the length and the breadth of this nation and across the globe. May they bring salvation. May they bring healing. May they bring liftings in the name of Jesus Christ. And as for you, because you came to church tonight, I decree, may the Lord bless you. I decree, may the Lord prosper you. I decree, may the Lord reveal himself to you. I decree that everything that has mocked God concerning your life, as a result of your coming tonight, I prophesy and I declare that it ceases from happening in your life. I sense in my spirit that there are people who whilst they heard this, our brothers and sisters sharing their testimony of financial miracles, their hearts were just open and they said, oh, that God would step in for me. The prophetic dimension to activating wealth, like I've always thought, is not a license for laziness. But there are times when you are in the sea. There are times when your net is good. There are times when your fishing skill is there, but you will still not catch fish. At that point, you do not need fishing skill. You need Jesus. And for those who have exhausted all that they know to do, and it looks like financial doors are not opening, I prophesy to you, in the name that is above all names, return with strange miracles. Please just help those under the anointing. Everyone here who is sick in his body, the devil has taken advantage of you, not the church. The church is a place where we separate light from darkness. I decree and declare that everything that represents darkness in your life, let it be far from your life now. And everything glorious in your life that you have lost, for, the, for people here, there are people, the proverb, Ichabod, seems to be the proverb around your life. I declare, may that proverb never be heard around your life again. Every business here, hear the word of the Lord. I decree and declare, the grace to excel, let it come upon you. Every dormant gift that is lying down within you, I decree and declare that gift is activated. And all those who can discern and reward that gift, I call them to pay attention to you. Hear me? If there is anyone here whose spiritual life is going down, prayer life going down, your passion for God going down, don't feel condemned and don't feel like there is no hope for you. This is the church, the place where you find hope. Therefore, I decree and declare fresh fire upon your spiritual life. For everyone here who has been bereaved and is in and through any kind of emotional pain, we decree and declare, let the healer bring healing right now. And we stand here prophetically and we lend our voices together with many who are praying over Nigeria, over Africa, over Abuja. We decree and declare in the name of Jesus Christ that the purposes of God will be established in our land. 
in the name of Jesus and every controlling power over this territory the territory of the FCT the nation of Nigeria the continent of Africa we lend our voices as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as a united force we decree and declare like Dagon fell before the ark we declare that every altar that does not project Jesus let it fall before the ark of his presence in the name of Jesus the Lord bless you the Lord honor you in Jesus name please everyone remain standing let me plead with us just give me two minutes let's be disciplined two minutes let me make the altar call please no moving around just two minutes and we're done there are people here God has given you an opportunity to hear this word tonight you came from various places please let's minimize movement it's it's a culture listen you have to train yourself in the house of God patience for two three minutes will not stop you from doing what you're doing as much as possible Whenever the altar call is coming, except otherwise, let's just discipline ourselves to receive them and then we'll wrap up. There are people here across the balcony, here in the main auditorium, all the overflows and following online. You are saying, Apostle, I've heard you teach and I want to become part of the church. The church is not just men, men who are in Christ, men who have accepted the free gift of salvation. Two categories of people I want to call quickly. Number one, those who are saying, I need Jesus as a matter of life and death. Number two, those who are saying, Apostle, my life has gone haywire. I need restoration to my Christian experience. If you belong to any of these two categories, I'm going to count one to five. Please, very quickly, I'd like you to rush and come and stand. Be very bold. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. God bless you. Let's celebrate them as they come. Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, Amen. Who is this King of glory, keep coming, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, keep coming, Amen. for thy name. The power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For thy the power forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, before I pray for all those who have come to give their heart to Jesus. Let me just make one very important announcement. Please let me have your attention. By God's grace, our medical team um, is embarking on an outreach to one of the IDPs here in, Kadu in, in uh, I was going to say Kaduna, in Abuja. Praise the name of the Lord. Are you happy? Celebrate Jesus. Amen. Um, can I have Dr. Chai please come? He's the head of the medical team. Please quickly just come. Now, the medical team is searching for volunteers. Volunteers who will participate in the medical outreach. Particularly, they are looking for doctors, nurses, lab scientists, and pharmacists. All interested persons, please, if you are interested in being part of this outreach, is a noble cause. When is it? The date? 4th of December. So we have just on Saturday. On the 4th of December, you're a paramedic, you're a medical person, and you feel that this is an opportunity, you want to be part of it, please, immediately after the service, he's going to be standing right here. You can come and meet him and say, I want to be part of it. And probably you want to just come in and support them in whatever way. We have taken responsibility as a ministry, but then we're also going to open up doors should you want to do anything without coercion, by revelation, from a heart of love, please feel free to do it. And so this is what test running our humanitarian services. So the medical team is leading on this and we want to see that we're able to bless the people and to bless God's people. There are so many people at that IDP camp and we want to just supply food, medicals and see how probably we sink a borehole or two or just do something 
for the community. God is granting us grace in the name of Jesus Christ. So please, immediately after the service, you want to be part of this uh, as a volunteer, please do well to see doctor. He'll be waiting there. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. I celebrate every one of you for coming. Thank you so much for making this bold decision. Please lift your right hand high above your head, and I want you to pray this prayer. Let it be from the depth of your heart. Say after me, Lord Jesus, I believe in you that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose again for my justification. Tonight, I have heard your word. I receive eternal life into my spirit and I declare that you are my savior, you are my Lord, and you are my king. I decree and declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. From today, I live a victorious Christian life, serving the purposes of God and being a blessing to humanity. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your hands lifted. Father, thank you for these precious people. We love them so. They have come before you, making their declaration to start a new life in Christ. I pray by the authority of Scripture that their sins are forgiven, and I decree and declare that you enjoy the ministry of the word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord honor you in Jesus' name. Thank you and congratulations. May I request that you just move to my right. There are a few counselors who will just attend to you within a minute or two and you'll be back to your seat. God bless you. Let's celebrate them as they go. Let's celebrate them very quickly. Hallelujah. And then... Um, maybe I would want to say this next week by the grace of God the 28th will be our last miracle service not the last service but the last miracle service for the year 2021 please let me encourage you everyone you love and seriously intend for them to receive the power of God healings, miracles, restoration whatever it is do well to inform them five on the dot we're starting and then on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I will be in Zaria. Wednesday for a teaching program. Thursday for the graduation of our School of Ministry students. And then Friday for the last miracle service for Zaria for the year 2021. So pray for us and you can connect online. The Lord will bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you for your patience. Let's share the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Let it rest and abide with us now and forever. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.